Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of Deco Musings. And uh, we have we have a very special guest with us today. I am just going to invite him into this session and I'll then give an introduction. Thank you all for logging in. Hi, just allow me. Hi. 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 How are you? Very well. How are you? Good, good. So thank you, Akshat, for we have people are still logging in. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of this session on Deco Musings. And uh, we'll be talking about designing for a new age. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to have you with here. Is there a connection lag? Can you feel a lag? Yes, I, I can see. Can you lag. hear me? Yes. Yeah, there is a lag. Okay. Do you want to log in from a different Wi-Fi? Is it better now? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, there's no lag? Technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Instagram difficulties. I call them Instagram difficulties. It's not as easy as we think. No, Anyways, thank you uh, very much. discipline for our audience and I'll jump into the questions. So the COVID pandemic, as we all know, has you know completely changed our world in many ways for the past few years or so. And from how we live, how we work, to how we socialize, and how we inhabit spaces and cities at large. You know, as we've heard you say that cities have become mankind's new natural habitat. But our planning paradigm uh, seems to have failed in the present moment. So taking off from that statement, we uh, today's theme is designing for a new age. And uh, we have with us Akshat Bhatt, who's principal architect at Architecture Discipline, uh, a Delhi-based multidisciplinary design practice. Uh, his work spans varied typologies from residential, retail interiors to large-scale public hospitality and commercial, uh, commercial assignments that are spread all over India. Uh, his work highlights the emergence of an architectural expression that is contemporary yet rooted in a critical understanding of regionalism. Notable projects by architectural discipline include a town hall and sales office for the Bhartiya city township in Bangalore, uh, projects for the Oberoi's, Oberoi Group's properties in Agra, Kolkata, uh, Delhi included, and the JDH Urban Regeneration Project, which aims to restore the historic walled city of Jodhpur to its former glory. Uh, Bhatt has also represented India on the global front with the Make in India Pavilion at Hanover in 2015, which was adjudged the best pavilion in the 65-year history of Messing. Most recently, architecture discipline presented their work at the London Design Biennale 2021, where three of their projects were part of design in an age of crisis, an online gallery of radical design ideas that were responding to the world's most pressing issues. So today we have Akshat with us talking about some of these projects and how he thinks we can look at designing for a new age. Thank you, Akshat, for being with us. Uh, if you can hear me, Thank I'm going to having you. Uh, my first question to you today is you often talk about how our cities have failed in planning and how the pandemic has made it you know, very, very evident. How can architects create better cities one building at a time? Well, I think in India, one of the what I what I see around us in Indian cities is that 
I, I think we're a fairly non-visual and more cerebral uh, people, and what what I what I see around us is you know at, at least in emerging in the structured world of architecture, is architecture which is really for photography and sort of styling as such, and it's not really value driven. And I would say if we have to change that, then the first thing we have to do is start designing the spaces outside our buildings, right? So design for our, for our neighbors, so to speak. Because I think while architecture happens, um, while the manifestation of architecture happens in the building, the city the, uh, exists or, or the city interacts with the, with the interstitial space between buildings. And I think that's really the first step, like start looking at what's happening outside and how, how we're affecting the outside world. Um, and, um, and then you, yeah, of course, go into a deeper dialogue on does a sort of massive city center still make sense? Does do these large masses of, uh, you know, so which, which are called central business districts and central residential areas, do they still make sense? Uh, do we really need to go uh, 30 stories high? I'm not saying that's bad. I, I, you know, I think, uh, and you know, when I make a statement like that, I know it can be construed loosely, but um, I am all for progressive work. You know that. But um, every design move or every planning move should be a considered one. I agree. Yeah, completely. Uh, so, I mean, yes, I think that is that is the sort of premise of architecture design, urban design today. We really need to, before we straight away jump to intervention, we need to step back and think about what is it that we are trying to do. So, uh, you know, just taking off from your uh, recent exhibitions uh, at the London Design Biennale, uh, we know that one of your projects, which is the Life Community Medical Facility, was exhibited there. How, is, how did it evolve as a response to the pandemic specifically? through repurposed materials. Could you share a little bit more information about that? So at the studio, we, you know, while the studio fundamentally believes in progress and evolution, and that's just natural, um, when we do greenfield projects, we look at, um, you know, we look at how we're creating a new history for, or a memory for tomorrow as such, right? And, and and therein we're exploring architectural forms, materials, techniques, spatial expressions, architectural expressions for the future. But we also realize that, you know, we're really living in a century where there is plenty. So it's, it's a time of recuperation and regeneration. Um, you can't ignore what has been done in the past. And, and, and for certain things that have survived, there is, there is, enough, uh, there is enough merit in them for them to, you know, uh, as, as a sort of, in a poetic sense, a, a memory for the, a, you know, a past which deserves to continue into the future. So, you know, giving it a new sense of history, uh, so to speak. Uh, in that, we realize there's also, um, you know, things like containers which are post-industrial waste, right? We, and and the live CMF project sort of emerged as, uh, you know, as a, as a reaction within the studio. It it was um, it wasn't really driven by me. It was driven entirely by the studio. And um, to be honest, I just encouraged it, you know, nothing more than that. And, uh, you know, that, and um, the idea really was, can we use, how can we quickly put a series of, uh, you know, systems together that can be used as either a, a primary healthcare facility or a, mm -hmm. you know, and can later be repurposed into, say, a convention, uh, into a, community function, maybe a little school or whatnot, many of which are really required, right? And it goes beyond just doing, just becoming a tent, you know, the fastest sort of deployment would just be large scale tents. But then how do you go beyond that and create something which is actually a little safer or a lot safer than that, you know, in the case of a hurricane or a, you know, or an earthquake or such. And that's how the life uh, uh, CMF project emerged. It emerged also because, you, as you know, we, we do have a few containers strewn around in our studio, which are used as a sort of ad hoc spaces. So how do you take post-industrial materials, create these little ad hoc solutions? Um, we had sort of envisaged then itself that, you know, and because we had read about, you know, uh, a pandemic or, or a virus sort of hitting 
a population in waves. So we realized that if we could repurpose things that existed without actually going into heavy manufacture, into um, additive construction systems and such, we could actually uh, make healthcare facilities that would last five or ten years, uh, and when they when when required, they could be repurposed as a school or such. Okay. So we believe that uh, that project, the uh, Life CMF, right, it's being developed into a primary clinic for the Delhi government, and you know it's become a project now. Could you elaborate mm -hmm. a little bit on that? Um, yeah, I mean that's. Um, I think we had uh, we had obviously reached out to them, and they were. Uh, this is before the second wave. Uh, we reached out to them, and we reached out to a few corporate entities. Um, and Tata Power kindly agreed to um, to fund the first two prototypes. And the Delhi government agreed to give us space. And as you know, the Delhi government has a pro has a series of these Mohalla Clinic projects, which is actually well recognized, and I think it's a great initiative. And uh, when we studied what the Mohalla clinics were going to be, um, and what the and what primary healthcare requires in such a space, we sort of quickly uh, we did a very quick uh, exercise, uh, surprisingly fairly sophisticated, uh, to to put together these these little uh, two module container Mohalla clinics for um, and and I and we're aiming to. Do 200 of them. Well, it starts with two, which should be, uh, which should be deployed in the near future. Uh, they they won't just be clinics; they'll also be place where you can get your medic med medicine, etc., and eventually become a sort of digital library. As you know, there's also, I mean, beyond just um, physical health and you know, sort of and and medicine that you need. People also need. Um, there are also sort of mental health issues that need to be addressed in our country. People don't have enough space to live, especially people who are living in squatter settlements. So they need little space outside. So um, the second set of evolution of these clinics is going to be uh, clinics plus sort of uh, digital libraries for for young children who who need space to work and and, and study. Right. That sounds really really interesting. Uh, yeah, we also see that you know there is with the second wave now, right? Already hit India in, in a really big way. Uh, we also see more people on the roads and lesser people sort of indoors, fewer people using public transport for reasons of safety and social distancing, right? People are, I mean, we all know that in the pandemic, open spaces are now safer spaces to be, right? What do you think in that context is the future of urban mobility? Well, I think urban the reinvention of urban mobility has been a long time coming, um, and I don't think it's only got to do with it. Only, I don't think it only has to do with the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic sort of has really brought forth the need for personal sort of space and sanitization and uh, you know health as such, but. If you just look at the mathematical or the financial numbers of mm -hmm. what it, the time taken and the cost of doing, say, a mass rapid transit system, or even mm -hmm. doing a bus network, you would be surprised, right? So I would imagine that the reason why the Delhi government has given free bus rides to um, uh, to um, uh, to ladies. Is not just a political gimmick. I mean, it, it because I, I think eventually these these sort of mass rapid transport systems stop making financial sense. Um, so we had actually done a prototype and an exercise for both uh, mass healthcare, which is hospitals, as well as um, as well as uh, mass tran or, or rapid tran transport systems, and we had. The, uh, which we called the CAT system, right? So it was a personalized uh, transport transportation system, and that's also been, I think, exhibited in a few places, maybe published. I can't seem to remember, but uh, wherein it was capsules for two to four people, right? And the frequency of these capsules can actually be changed based on time of day. So, and, and you know, they, these kind of exercises have been done many times. Mercedes did this in 2009 with their smart cars. Where you don't own a car, you own a card, you know, and you can, yeah. because you're most part of the day your car is actually just standing outside, and again, for most part, you're really 
paying um, you know a lease on your vehicle which is not even equivalent to the fuel that you consume and such so it was kind of like a leasing model but this would be a government owned model um, and as we started sort of engaging with this activity we realized that the first such uh, capsule automated transport system uh, which sort of becomes a mass transportation system but also has like a it has a it has a 20 second call or or redensification time frame uh, so the flexibility of say an auto rickshaw but with the mm-hmm. convenience of you know being sheltered like yeah. a bus and, and such um, has been tried it has been it it was first developed for the heathrow terminal 5 in london it was a 19 year exercise it was then tried at it is it is in the prototype with uh, at mazda city uh, in abu dhabi and uh, and i think now at the hong kong the new hong kong airport as well and we so this was our attempt and we sort of put that forward and said i think the future of mass transport is actually personalized and not mass right. there in we actually did go reach out again we have reached out to the government to say can we start doing this prototype with in what i would have loved is to have done this with the tata nano but mm-hmm. that's not going to be so maybe with you mm-hmm. know with suzuki we're talking to suzuki for something now oh interesting very interesting uh which you know actually it's a perfect sort of time to talk about my next question uh we talk about social distancing we're talking about people not wanting to engage you know with other people there is a fear of inhabiting or engaging with public spaces right the need for social distancing overtakes everything else and is limiting people from safely engaging with any sort of uh, public space or any outdoor space in that context how can design be a tool to maintain control yet to maintain and control proximity in open spaces well see for the open spaces answer is easy we are actually developed if if you remember of, of you know when this pand- the first exercise we did when the mm-hmm. pandemic hit us and we went into lockdown was that we developed uh, a choker right and it was soon after that that uh, uh, that the arogya setu app came out but the, the intention of the choker was really to use some like a, a system called um, well to use a mesh network which was off grid so you were not really logged in but if you had if you were running high of fever or if you had been sick recently or if you came in contact with someone sick it um, it was a sort of it was a sort of arm band a kind of sign, or a neck band kind of sign of the yeah. times like like we used to have the aids ribbon on for cancer there was the uh, you know the live strong uh, silicon band so this this yeah. kind of became, it, it it became that so this was a kind of visual gesture of saying you know we belong together yet you know this is my current situation No, no, I lost you for a bit. Am I okay? So, I'm here. Um, yeah, yes. So, I, the 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 choker came about because we were a thinking of of participating in Burning Man, and we said, you know, these kind of mass tribal gatherings won't happen again. And what what will it take to make something like this happen? And um, I can't seem to remember the second reason, but but there was a, a really valid reason. Yes, it was because we didn't want to be tracked. And third. Uh, was th- we have a huge film industry right i mean india has uh, bollywood kind of super big here and we needed to figure out how we could make say a pvr cinema work again and people feel secure when they sort of go in without you know having a device pointed at your forehead or at your arm almost like a gun so i think one is a uh, sort of a personalized sort of indicator But I think more importantly, public spaces, like you know, outdoor spaces, have been much ignored in this country, right? And even in since the 70s, I would say, and parks are sort of cordoned off. We've got fences around them. We take pride in those fences. So parks are no longer urban spaces. There are no real urban spillouts, and that's when, you know, like my first answer, which was, you know, the spaces in between buildings, um, sort of become more important. And I think it's. is really important that we start engaging with that right because it's the building that in extreme weather gives you shadow where required mm-hmm. so we really need to go back to to 
to some of those principles and not focus only on maximizing efficiency on a plot agreed completely i actually had some images of the choker and the mohalla clinics here but somehow instagram is not allowing me to post i was trying that in the middle but uh, for anybody who wants to see i think more information on this you can check the architecture discipline website a uh, very interesting ideas on how one can continue to come together in public spaces in larger numbers and i think we are all exploring you know what design how design can play a role today uh one last question the pandemic has i mean we started from the city and we came down to public spaces and open spaces and now i'm coming down to the individual home right uh the pandemic has tra- completely transformed the way we live in our homes you know with boundaries between blur- completely blurring between living working playing leisure time relaxation time uh today we inhabit our own homes very differently uh what is the future you know what are the residences of the future going to look like Mm. Uh, well, I hope they start looking better than what they do today, and a little more efficient, uh, a little more focused on flexibility. Right? You you can't design buildings like temples any longer, right? With, so I think there has to be some some sense of sense of flexibility in these spaces. Um, you know, and and again, like, I, and I'm conscious of when I'm saying this that I'm I'm talking about. Uh, Residence is developed for a privileged lot, right? I mean, and I also know that there is a very large underprivileged population that we have, which, which is still, you know, three cam- families cl- crammed into ten feet by ten feet, you know, which is, which is terrible. Uh, and that there is no social distancing. You cannot have any form of social distancing. Yes. Yeah, that, that's where policy comes in, and I and I have to say that I'm I'm happy, and we happen to have been part of a few discussions where, where some of that level of this. you know some of those people are also going to be addressed in in the near future by uh, the government uh, but i think for the ones of for for those who can afford a house of their own with with enough space i think flexibility um planning for uh, multi use spaces and such should become a uh, you know a priority i would say plan a a house for three generations and not, or a home for three generations and not for one uh, and i'm not saying that i'm not saying that i'm i'm endorsing the joint family i'm saying plan for three generations or whatever size your family is uh, because this the idea of refreshing uh, interior spaces every 3 to 5 years also is a, not just a waste generation exercise it's, it's it's creating a hell number of problems and the reduction of our patterns of consumption will start from your home that's where you really do condition yourself for it uh, so recycle and the future generations and the future generations yeah. as well so recycle replenish reuse save um uh, think long life cycle think uh think recyclability think modularity uh think multifunction and you sort of get there and it none of these are new ideas per se i think it's just ideas that we abandoned because most of architecture and interior design has been engaging with vanity projects for the last two decades i'm glad you say that <laughs> yeah well look at, at in this studio we attempt to sort of learn from one end of the spectrum and pass that on to the other right so when you're doing a five star hotel or a, you know you know an upscale there's uh, an up market sort of retail store or or such there is enough learning on it in terms of strategy and detail that can be passed on to the more underprivileged lot you know which where you don't have the room for experimentation where you do need to get it spot on um that's not to say that you have a lot of room for experimentation at the highest level you yeah, you don't because there are economic uh, criteria that have to be met but there is enough learning in that right there you can't go wrong uh, when you're when you're when you're doing any ws housing you just can't and there is no reason why they do not deserve a good quality of built environment yeah i think yes i would i mean i'd like to say that i think architects need to remind themselves of the responsibility that they have as professionals you know that's it really starts from there i mean obviously as individuals as citizens as citizens of the world 
we all need to think of um you know of of like you said of the next generation and recycling and you know reusing these are words that need to become more common but at the same time uh, we should uh, also as as because you're talking about design and architecture we sometimes underestimate the user role uh, that we have to play and we need to go back and sort of take on that responsibility upon ourselves yeah i i i had i think i've said this before and i'm going to repeat the cost of repeating myself you know the there are practices that are just not you know that are doing planning work for larger cities for you know healthcare spaces for transport they are not spoken about or celebrated right i think it's about time that we start uh giving them some recognition um there are very few practices that are spoken about publicly that are actually working for mass uh development on the city uh, and i think and at the other end of the spectrum i think interior design needs to be a control practice now right there is no there is no licensing for interior design there's no control on it i think that I, and i think interior designers need to dis, dis, realize their responsibility um uh, i think practicing international practices like foster and partners and all now speak about how sustainability is has to become uh a fundamental in the practice of interior design which is just something that we not we don't seem to be expressing or or demonstrating in 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 our uh, country at the moment yeah i think at at a personal level i know that you know uh, the work that we do and a lot of i mean we've discussed this many a times and even episodes when we're doing this the idea i think as anybody in the design community we need to become a little more democratic a little more open a little more sort of you know uh less discriminating more open to ideas being shared uh uh even i think this deco musings the whole series is the idea is to have because when we talk about these issues we will become more responsible it will start reflecting in our work whether it's interior design architecture doesn't matter the idea is that we should at least recognize these issues and then it will impact our work and that we will see as a reflection in the built environment yes, okay great thank you yeah thank you akshat this was very very insightful and uh, i wish i could have shared the images but i haven't uh, we've got a link there for anybody who wants to see uh, more information congratulations uh, for representing india at the london design biennale uh, and uh, keep doing the good work and thank you for being a part of the series yeah thank you for having me see thank you, you thanks a lot bye